are watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. I believe so. As ready as I'm getting. Celestial greetings. I'm Janet Booth, a professional astrologer from West Hartford, Connecticut, and welcome to my program on astrology called Looking Up. I chose that name because I want us always to try to look on the bright side of things or to at least, at least see what's coming our way, like heads up, <laughs> but looking up. And this is now into, I think, the 17th year I think I've completed 16 years of looking up. Wow. So we're into a new year now, 2017, and numerologically, it is a one year. And we mentioned that just briefly in the show for December 2016, which was, I think, called something like Surfing the Wild Waves of 2017 or something along that line. And it is going to be kind of a wild year. And I want you to review that program from time to time because I'm not always going to go into month by month just what's happening. We did that a lot in prior years of looking up. And I kind of want to do something a little bit different with 2017. I'm going to have some guests sometimes, which I haven't had in a while. Today, I want to focus on something that's a topic that can be applied across the course of your life and that has more of a lasting informational quality to it than just looking at oh what's happening in January 2017. I'm going to mention a few things near the end of this program that are about things that are going on in 2017 but mostly we're going to talk about today's topic which is managing oppositions. So we hear that opposites attract but we also can hear that they repel, or maybe they complement each other and balance each other. And we can think in terms of oppositions you know, between people, but there's also, what I'm mostly going to talk about today, is oppositions between signs. So we have 12 signs of the zodiac, and you can think of them in terms of six pairs of opposite signs. And when we think about the opposite signs, we might want to think about, yes, they can balance or they can contrast, they can conflict. They can also offer us alternate ways of behaving. Because to me, all what the signs are is means of behavior. So when we think in terms of these opposites, they might be almost like two poles on the end of a spectrum. And along that spectrum, we have lots of gradations or variants. So it's not just black or white. It's all the shades of gray. And usually an opposition in astrology is something that forces us to confront or interact with something outside of ourselves. However, in your own birth chart, you can have planets that are across the sky from one another, six signs apart or 180 degrees roughly apart from one another. And that can show some difficulties even internally. Perhaps some of it is things that you've adopted from your outer experience or things that were implanted into you from your early upbringing. And almost always that kind of a planetary opposition in your natal chart will show things that are your greatest challenges 
and generally sparked by something outside of yourself. Okay, so all of the signs have what we might label positive or negative traits, or we might label them pleasant or unpleasant traits. We might say good or bad. We don't want to get too much into value judgments, but some traits tend to lead us to a greater place of maybe integration, happiness, peaceful existence, success, however you want to define that, and some traits are going to take us in the opposite direction. So we're looking to find the results that we really want. Now these six pairs of oppositions, I'm going to talk about them frequently, and if you're not real familiar with the order of the planets in the zodiac, you can always go to astrologybooth.com, into the study booth, the beginner's topics, and there you will find at the bottom of the list, sometimes it's hard to gravitate to, and maybe I'll tell my webmaster to take it to the top, something I call the Astrologer's Apprentice Cheat Sheet, and it lists all of these um, signs, their traits, and mm, it doesn't exactly show those oppositions. That is the same information that if you happen to have my Janet's Planets, you're going to find in the back something called the keywords. It's the same thing that's on that free download of the Astrologer's Apprentice Cheat Sheet. So the first sign of the zodiac, Aries, is opposite the seventh sign of the zodiac, which is Libra. Then we have the second sign is Taurus, and that's going to be opposite the eighth sign, which is Scorpio. The third sign of the zodiac is Gemini, and it's going to be opposite the ninth sign, which is Sagittarius. The fourth sign, Cancer, is opposite the tenth sign, Capricorn. The fifth sign, Leo, is opposite the eleventh sign, Aquarius. And the sixth sign, Virgo, is opposite the twelfth sign, Pisces. And we're going to talk about them in that order, just to help reinforce for you that order of the natural zodiac. Now, <clears throat> any pair of signs that are opposite will be in the same category of signs called a mode or quality, of which there are three. So there's two sign pairs, actually four signs in each of these three modes, and four times three is 12, and there we have the nice dozen signs in our zodiac. And that's another reason why we don't want any 13th sign like the astronomers are trying to foist on us with that Ophiuchus, so just forget about that. So these three modes are kind of like ways of behaving. You might be familiar with the words modus operandi, which are Latin words that you hear on crime shows. What's that criminal's M.O.? Oh, he always comes in through the back door and, you know, leaves a rose on the stove or whatever. They got the M.O., so we know, oh, that's the rose murderer. Oh, what an awful image. Uh, anyway, so modus means way and operandi of operating. So these are ways of operating. So the first sign pair, Aries Libra, and then the, I guess it would be the fourth one? Yes, Cancer Capricorn. They're in the same mode, and that mode is called cardinal. And I've mentioned this before, I made the little joke about, oh, these are cardinal signs, not cardinal sins. But cardinal just means action-oriented. We'd rather confront than wiggle out of something or stand our ground. Those are kind of the three modes. So cardinals meet things head on, they're action oriented, they're um, always thrust into decision or action mode. Or let's say if you have those song, signs prominent in your chart, you get thrown into that action and decision mode. The second one is the fixed modes, and that's sort of like stand your ground. I oftentimes think of the uh, movie Dances with Wolves and his kind of girlfriend who was raised by the Native Americans, even though she had been born of um, settlers. Her nickname in the Indian language was Stands with Fists, because she would always stand stubborn with her fists. Um, so that's like what this fixed mode is like, not budging. Persevering, great. Finishing, 
Yes, you know, cardinal signs, they like to get things started. They don't always get things finished. Fixed signs, they have a hard time starting stuff, but they get things done. Sometimes they're finishing up things that other people started. And the third mode is called mutable, or think of adaptable, or a mutation is a change. So mutable signs would rather dodge and weave and get out of the way than confront or stand their ground. And these are probably the easier oppositions to deal with because they have a little bit more wiggle room to them. So I did not mention the fixed modes are Taurus, Scorpio, and Leo Aquarius. And then we get to the mutable signs, and those are Gemini, Sagittarius, and Virgo, Pisces. Now, since we have two pair of opposite signs in each of these modes, you have one opposition, you have another opposition, and they form a natural cross. And the cross is sort of the hardest thing to deal with. If you had points planets or something in your chart on all four points of a cross like that, you feel like you're always being pulled in conflicting directions. And like it's hard to just get to that center and let the rest of the whirlwind spin around you. But that's really the best way to handle that. So that sometimes we might not even be confronting an opposition between planets in our chart in the same mode. We might just be confronting one of these parts of the cross, which is called the square, the 90 degrees. And again, the mode is giving the tone of how those signs get along. And when it's a square, it's much more apt to be something very internal that we're dealing with, less external, like the opposition brings out the external. So when you look at your chart next time, Check and see if you have three or more planets in any one of the sign pair oppositions. Because if you do, that's going to really highlight your issues and challenges and tell you what you keep dealing with over and over again. And that opposition will be activated at least twice a year, if not strongly, at least somewhat, when full moons occur, because a full moon is by nature, by definition, an opposition between the sun and the moon. Whatever sign the sun is going through, when the moon comes to the opposite sign, boom, there's your full moon. So you're always going to see at least that much opposition in your life, even if you don't have an opposition in your birth chart, and not everybody does. And when you don't, it may be a little more difficult to put yourself in the shoes of another person or to deal with confrontation when it comes at you from outside yourself because you haven't had a lot of experience with it. But always when we have these activations of our oppositions, it gets us a chance to see where are we on that spectrum between the two polar opposites. Now you can have a temporary opposition in your life from the moving planets, especially when they're the slow ones that come and hang out at a degree for a while or in that neighborhood of lining up across from one of your natal planets. And when it's something like Pluto, this might go on for over a year, even Neptune. So mm, Jupiter, you'll be done with it in less than a year, but it's still going to be big, magnified. That's the big planet, right? So you also have a few in your life of personal full moons in what we call your progressions. Progressions say sort of what progress do you make, and we take it from a symbolic level of looking in those days and weeks and months after you're born as if seeds were planted that unfold later. And so in those months after your birth, there were new moons, there were full moons. And we look at all those days after your birth as each day represents a year of your life. So when you're 15, we look 15 days after your birth. If you're 35, we look 35 days after your birth. Well, guess what? A moon cycle is about 29 and a half, 30 days on a regular ongoing basis. And in your progressions, that's 29 and a half or 30 years. So depending on what part of the cycle you're born into and how long you live, you'll have one or two or three 
possibly even four full moons by progression in your lifetime. And when you do, things come to a head in a really big way and that lasts for many, many months. And you can't ignore this kind of stuff. It's in your face. So another kind of opposition that all of us have is between what's called the North Node and the South Node of the Moon. There's nothing in the sky there, but what it is is it's the intersection of two important orbits. The Sun orbit, Earth Sun, we're busy going around the Sun, and while we're busy going around the Sun, the Moon's busy going around us. It's our satellite. So the, those orbits are a little bit tipped in relationship to one another, and the Moon will go above the Earth Sun orbit half the month, below the Earth Sun orbit the other half of the month. The shifting points, those intersections, are called this North Node, South Node. So does the Moon ascend north at the North Node, descends south at the South Node? This forms a natural opposition within you that says, here are things that I'm continually connecting with other people to learn the lesson of, because the nodes are very much bonders or connectors. If you look at the symbol of them, it looks like two circles. They're either joined by a rope above or a rope below, but it is kind of like you're yoked. It actually almost looks like a yoke, um, the one with the upper rope. So the eclipses happen when the new moon, sorry, when the full moon, sun moon opposition is very close to those node intersections. So each year we have a pair of new and full moons that are an opposition, um, bring out those oppositions. Okay, so we're going to talk about that just a little bit briefly. And it's not all cut and dried. You maybe don't just have one polarity that you're dealing with. Almost always you've got more than one happening in your life. Sometimes they're interacting with one another. And I'll probably come back and give you some examples of that before we're all said and done. But I do want us to go into each of these polar opposites in some depth. So Aries Libra will be the first one we talk about. Aries is the sign of the individual. Libra is the sign of marriage or the couple or the team, partnering. So do you do things solo? Is independence very important for you? Or are you almost more codependent? That's sort of the negative side of that Libra joining energy. And I meant to mention this before, but now's a good time. When we are in a place of low self-esteem, or when we're kind of operating to the negative side of things, the worst traits of the opposite sign will come out in you. So, for instance, I'm a Libra. I'm supposed to be all, you know, nice and peaceful and get along with everybody. But if I'm in a bad place, I can be selfish. I can be argumentative. You know, you don't want to get in a fight with Janet. So, and it comes from some other places in my chart, too. It's not just this. But I just mean to point out that a bad Libra can behave like a bad Aries. Or if you say Aries is supposed to be so indecisive, I'm so decisive and know what they want. But if they're in a bad place, they become more like the worst traits of Libra, which is indecisive. So we have this sort of independence, codependence is a spectrum on the Aries-Libra um, axis. Another one might be aggression, assertiveness versus compromise, negotiation. You take that to the extremes, you've got war versus peace. But somewhere in between that, with the um, shades of gray, you've got, well, okay, I'm going to assert a little bit, but then I'm going to be willing to compromise. And when you're realizing if you're way far out on the end of one of those spectrums, you need to maybe come back more towards the middle. So you don't want to be too compliant, but you don't want to be too bossy. You want to find your happy medium along that Aries-Libra continuum. On the Taurus-Scorpio continuum, well, by its very nature, Taurus is the sign of blossoming. It's a spring sign when the sun goes through Taurus. Scorpio is a fall sign, well, in our hemisphere, when things look like they're dying. It's literally life versus death. Or, you know, do you hang on for dear life? Or do you surrender into 
the ultimate transformation of everything. So this is a sign that has to do about change and not change. Generally, Tauruses are very adverse to change and even risk-taking. Scorpios, it is a sign of transformation. We're supposed to learn how to change with Scorpio energy, but some Scorpios would rather just also hang on for dear life. It's also an axis very much about possession, whether something's mine or is it ours. And is there selfishness? Is there jealousy? Um, it's about possessing things or releasing and letting go. Do we hold on? There's also a practical versus emotional side to this. So Taurus, earth sign, very down to earth. Scorpio, water sign, feelings are deep. Sometimes private, sometimes hidden, but always working underneath the surface. I sometimes jokingly say, well, it's a fixed sign, and it's a water sign, so it's kind of like a lake, a nice placid lake, only the Loch Ness monsters underneath there. So um, the other thing that's strong with the Taurus Scorpio spectrum is about sensuality and sexuality. You know, do we just participate for the feel of it, the touch, Taurus, or is there, you know, reproduction or uh, attempt to not reproduce, which is more on the Scorpio end of things, because that is the sign of reproduction. With the Gemini-Sagittarius opposition, Gemini is the sign of our own personal mind, our thoughts, our ideas. Sagittarius is something beyond us. It's where many thoughts collect. It's the body of knowledge. It's the university. It's the internet where all knowledge resides. So it has also to do with things that are near and close by on the Gemini side or things that are very far away on the Sagittarius side. Or do you just want to like be the drive around your own town kind of person, Gemini? Or are you the world traveler? You know, you always go into the airport or getting on a ship. There's also the student versus teacher in the Gemini Sagittarius spectrum. Now you have to be a student before you can become a teacher. And if you're a teacher and you stop learning, you can't really serve your students well. So you need to keep sliding back and forth along that continuum. And there's also the idea of neighbor versus foreigner, somebody who you feel like is in group or somebody who's outside of your group, the other. In the Cancer Capricorn axis, these are related to parental issues many times. Are you in the mode where you need taking care of or are you in the caretaker role? Those are actually kind of two sides of the cancer energy. It's the maternal energy, more warm, nurturing. Well, here we go. It's a water sign again. Capricorn, practical earth sign, is much more um, telling other people what to do, can be judgmental, wants to be in control. Well, anytime you have... A, opposition in Cancer, Capricorn, control issues are going to come into play. Sometimes your sort of parental issues extend outside of your family household. So you'll find adults who are in a relationship, like a marital relationship, but she's still looking for her daddy or he's still looking for a mommy. So they really haven't resolved their own parental needs uh, or child needs in order to have a healthy adult relationship. There's that idea of the sensitivity of cancer and the cold-shouldered side of Capricorn. In the Leo-Aquarius opposition, we've got now, Leo oftentimes represents also the child, but it's sort of like the childlike qualities of um, play and creativity and it's a fire sign. It works a lot on inspiration. Opposite that, we have an intellectual sign of Aquarius. It's more like Spock from Star Trek. No feelings at all, but very inventive, very scientific. So do you act from the heart, ruled by Leo, or do you act from the head, which is very air sign, very 
Well, it can be Gemini, it can be Aquarius, um, things that rule the brain. Also, Leo has that royalty side to it. It's the sign of the king. Uranus is the masses. It's groups of people. So what do you gravitate more towards? Do you want to be dictatorial or do you want to be consensus oriented? With Leo, there's more of a play side. With Aquarius, there might be more of an invention side. But there's got that spectrum in between, right? So it's kind of through play and experimentation that we get the aha inspiration that leads to the invention. And that's a nice use of the Leo Aquarius energy. And finally, the last sign pair is Virgo Pisces. Well, here we have another earth sign, um, water sign, kind of, um, I won't say conflict, just a different way of approaching. Because Virgo, practical down to earth, earth sign, Pisces, very emotion-based, sensitive, water sign. So we've got a sort of skeptical side from Virgo and maybe a gullible side from Pisces. There's maybe a judgmental, critical side with Virgo versus a sympathetic and empathetic side that comes with Pisces. And the spectrum about service is very important with this sign pair because Virgo is the sign of being of service and Pisces is a very selfless, charitable sign, but oftentimes gets like the short end of the stick. They put themselves last. They get walked on and used more than any other sign. So I like to say you can be a server without being subservient, and that would be gravitating nicely along that spectrum. So some of the ways to look for this in your life in 2017? Well, we always want to be checking out where are those nodes? And that's where we have the eclipses. So we have the north node going through Virgo, the south node going through Pisces as the year begins. Then at the end of April, it shifts and it always moves backwards through the zodiac. The north node goes into Leo, the south node into Aquarius. North node is what we're supposed to approach, but it's kind of harder. It's almost like the magnet poles that repel. Whereas the south node, it's what's comfortable, but it doesn't bring us any growth. And it's actually what we need to sort of release. So we're in a place where we need to become a little more skeptical, a little more serving, more practical, and give up some of our fears and um, gullibility or that sense of victimization, which is Pisces. And this will be emphasized by those eclipses, which come especially the uh, lunar, nope, new moon eclipse in Pisces on 226. Okay, so it looks like we're running out of time, and I may talk a little bit more about some of these oppositions in 2017 as we go on into the year. So I think for you today, what your takeaway is and what your homework is, is see what you identify along on these spectrums and how can you shift your behavior maybe more towards the opposite pole if you're uncomfortable with what you've been experiencing. So. How's that for something new to work with in your one year? And we'll talk more again soon on Looking Up.